Hello and welcome to The Legal Edition. I'm your host, Attorney Mary Kay Alloyan. Our show topic today, Blind to Betrayal, Breaking the Silence of Trauma and Abuse. Our guest is Dr. Jennifer Fried. She is Professor Emerit of Psychology at the University of Oregon and editor of the Journal of Trauma and Dissociation. She is also affiliated faculty of the Women's Leadership Lab at Stanford University and founder and president of the Center for Institutional Courage. She is a research scholar, author, educator, and speaker on the psychological effects of betrayal trauma and abuse. Let's welcome Dr. Jennifer Fried. Welcome, Dr. Fried. Thank you. Now, you are best known for your work on your theories of betrayal trauma, um, DARVO, Institutional Betrayal and Institutional Courage. And of course, your book, Blind to Betrayal, Why We Fool Ourselves, But Why We Aren't Being Fooled. Can you explain what is betrayal blindness? Betrayal blindness is a survival mechanism that people have to survive the situation when they're being betrayed by somebody they're dependent upon. And it comes about because the dependence relationship requires staying engaged. And when people are betrayed, their inclination is to confront or withdraw, which works if there's not a dependence relationship. But in a dependence relationship, that creates a terrible bind for the person because they withdraw or confront somebody they absolutely need or believe they absolutely need. So by being blind to the betrayal, they get to stay in that relationship. So it's, it, 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 many times it may keep them alive. And, but how, how does it manifest um, in, in the victim? What happens? Yeah, there's more than one way it can manifest, um, especially for children who are betrayed by a caregiver, a child by, betrayed by a parent or close teacher, say. One way it can manifest is in forgetting the abuse ever happened. Um, so uh, the child has, will um, essentially block out the information from conscious awareness. And this is a very effective way for staying in the relationship because the child doesn't have to look at the caregiver and think about the mistreatment. A way that betrayal blindness can also occur is in, in essentially telling oneself quite a story, um, taking the blame upon themselves of the behavior of the other person, feeling a lot of shame for the way they were treated by somebody else, and basically kind of mental gymnastics in order not to feel betrayed by the perpetrator of the betrayal. And what is the uh, perpetrator, how is the perpetrator benefiting in these situations? Well, the perpetrator gets to have continued access to the victim. It keeps the relationship going. So um, it's very much in the perpetrator's interest. Furthermore, the perpetrator is not held accountable because the victim doesn't acknowledge the mistreatment to the point of holding the person accountable. And this occurs, what, in sexual abuse, in um, what other types of abuse situations? So we've seen it in situations where there is a close relationship with trust and dependence, and there is severe mistreatment. So it can be, for instance, certainly it can be sexual abuse. Um, it can also be, uh, be domestic violence. It can be somebody living with an abusive partner where they might not totally forget. They might recast what happened to them in a way that really distorts it. We've seen it um, with marital infidelity, where people are living with an unfaithful partner, and it can be really obvious to people from the outside that the infidelity is occurring, but the victim of that infidelity may just not see it, despite it being, in some sense, in plain sight. Mm. And you've worked in your research lab with, I, I read the book, it, it was absolutely fascinating. It was, I think it's a must read for anyone who has experienced um, abuse and to under really fully understand uh, the dynamics of, of abuse and betrayal. 
t can you tell us some of the scenarios that you've seen it manifest in your laboratory? Um, well, you know, we studied um, a whole range of different kinds of victimization, and we see betrayal trauma in, um, in different ways. Um, betrayal trauma is the, the behaviors, um, and then betrayal blindness as a response in different ways. One of the ways that I think is particularly interesting is when individuals are betrayed by institutions they're dependent upon, and they need to stay connected to the institution. So um, in many cases, what they do is block out information about that betrayal and, and stay involved in the institution. Such as the Catholic Church. Um, I, I did a program recently um, with one of the attorneys who did um, so, uh, litigate some of the cases on the Catholic Church. And he talked about, you know, what his clients had gone through and um, but didn't use the word betrayal, but uh, it's clearly that's what it was. Yeah, it's interesting. The word betrayal um, is often not used for the experience of betrayal, which can be part of betrayal points. People don't want to label it. Um, and yet, if you look at art and literature, the themes of betrayal, whether the word's used or not, the themes of betrayal are there all the time. So it, it's a big it's a big issue for human beings, and it's because we are very social creatures who need to be able to trust others around us. And every time we trust somebody, we have some vulnerability to being betrayed by that person. In essence, the child is the perfect victim because they are vulnerable, because they are dependent. And often they can be silenced um, by fear of the parent. Um, you know, that they will be punished or something bad will happen, you know, if, if they tell. And I think that's part of the problem, is it not? Yes, it is. Children are afraid of losing their parents. I mean, if the consequence help has the parent taken away, that can be just totally terrifying to the child. Um, for good reason. They are dependent on the parent and they love the parent. I think that's one of the things, too, that is important to understand is that we um, are very prone are kind of wired this way to love those we take care of and those who take care of us. And this is well known in the psychology research world as the attachment system. Um, we're born with it and we experience it and in an everyday sense through the, as the emotion of love. And when we are dependent on somebody, we almost always form a love relationship with them. Um, you see this like in something like Stockholm's and it's very natural you start to love somebody that you're dependent on it. I think one reason is it it helps that that dependency uh, help make sure that the person who is responsible for providing resources keeps doing. Um, and so whenever there's this love, there can be terrific hurt by having it betrayed. And one of the reasons betrayal can be so damaging to people is the psychological element of, of being hurt by the very person or even organization you love. So the dependency creates a, a kind of a, a, a paradox. Um, they, the child has to love, um, but at the same time, that love is painful. And there's just no other way around it because if they did go into foster care, that could also uh, be even potentially even more painful or more traumatic. Yeah, and I mean, a child has no way to know what the alternatives are, right? right? Like um, in, in our society, we haven't done a very good job of providing sufficient numbers of safe alternatives. But for a young child, even if, even if society was providing those alternatives, how would a child know that to, from the child's perspective, parent gets to control reality, they are utterly dependent on that parent, even if the parent's mistreating them. And a child that pulls away from a, a parent can just risk further mistreatment. It's very dangerous to mm -hmm. withdraw from that abusive parent. Even though some teenagers, they they, they say themselves, and some some older uh, older children as well, but I think what I what I'd like to explore more is about the institutions and 
you know, this can happen in, and it is happening. We hear it now with the police. People feel that the police have betrayed them, especially many black Americans. Um, the judicial system, um, how it uh, puts victims uh, again in harm's way and re-victimizes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Yes. There are so many institutions each of us depends on that have as part of the, the duty and mission of the institution to protect us. So that, what is the police? It's about, you know, protecting citizens um, from, from the harm that can come from breaking laws. What are, you know, what are hospitals? Protecting our bodies. Schools are entrusted with protecting our well-being in all sorts of ways. And the government is largely, you know, a huge amount of what the government is supposed to do is protect. So all of these roles are kind of parents, right? They're, they're these roles of institutions to help protect us from dangers in the world. And we tend to be quite dependent on them. So it's all right for betrayal. It's, I think it's important to realize betrayal can harm in two different One is I would call the pragmatic. If you're dependent on the police and you call them and they don't come, they're harming you pragmatically. Or if they come and they shoot you, I mean, this is this, you know an understatement to the harming. Uh, but there's another way, which is the psychological element, which is this betrayal of trust, and that way can occur even if you're not the direct victim. So you may have great trust in your church and then find out that the church leader has sexually abused somebody, maybe embezzled some money, something that was a betrayal. But you were not the direct victim. You can still experience the pain of that betrayal. And when an institution betrays, you may be pragmatically harmed or you may um, be aware it's going on and you may feel that psychological and for people who are pragmatically harmed, you know, if they had some expectation, justice, protection, they're going to get, they're going to feel both harms, the pragmatic harm and the psychological. What about bystander betrayal? Can you talk a little bit about bystander betrayal and why do bystanders often get um, uh, silenced by the perpetrator? Yeah, well, you know, bystanders can be in the same kind of bind as a victim. So let's say you're working at a workplace where there's betrayal of your colleague and you see it. If you confront the your employer, you may lose your job. You you may risk exactly what a victim is. Even though you are not the, the victim of the mistreatment, you now have this dangerous knowledge. So one way out is trail blindness. It's not seeing, fully seeing, or not comprehending the meaning of the mistreatment, and thus escaping the cost. There can be great cost to people in knowing about mistreatment because they are motivated to take actions that can have pretty big consequences. Now, what about in, in the Parent, a parent situation where one parent is abusing the child and the other parent turns a blind eye. Why is, is it the same reason as the institution? Is there some benefit that's accruing to that other parent so they don't want to rock the boat? Is that the similar analogy? Yes, I mean, it doesn't mean they consciously are thinking they don't want to rock the boat. But especially if the parent who's turning a blind eye was abused in their own childhood, they've learned this as a strategy for how to get through a difficult situation, which is don't see it fully. And if a parent who does see it fully can um, protect their child, and that's wonderful, but they might risk um, violence, they might risk financial ruin. Uh, so th there can be a really big cost to the parent in fully seeing what's going on even though we would want the parent to see it and take protective action. Um, but I think, you know, there's a way we can understand such parents as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then also too, um, 
you know, there's this gaslighting element that goes on too. I, is that when one parent or one person sees what's going on, but they're using this gaslighting technique so you start questioning whether you're really seeing that or not? Is that, how does that work? Yeah, so gaslighting can happen both by intent and just by accident. So if a parent, for instance, is able to not see what's really going on, they, the parents define reality for children. So let's say right. an abusive father and the mother just can't acknowledge it. Um, the, the abusive, the, the, the mother who's failing to protect might say to the child, oh, nothing's going on, it's all in your mind. Not with an intent to gaslight, but with the impact of gaslighting. Um, or, you know, sometimes people gaslight on purpose. They want to cover their tracks. And parents have so much power over children in terms of defining reality. So this is something that goes on all the time. And it's a, it's related to this concept um, of garbo that is a, a very conscious purpose. A very conscious purpose? Now, is this whole betrayal blindness, is it conscious on the part of the of the perpetrator or is it unconscious or is it both? I think both in different situations. Some perpetrators can specifically groom people to have betrayal. But other perpetrators probably do it without a conscious awareness they're doing it. And the alcoholic personality, I think, also fits into this paradigm as well, I think. Yeah. Yeah, I think quite kind of widespread and all, maybe all of us have some amount of it. If, I, I think it, if each of us reflects on situations where later we came to see something was really not right and then reflects back, we might have had inkings and then engaged in these ways of remaining blind in order not to want to vote. Mm -hmm. Now in your book you talk about, and I, I thought this point was fascinating, like the Holocaust and genocides. People need to acknowledge what has happened in the past so that that can be hopefully prevented in the future, that that trauma has to be acknowledged. But we also see this in, sometimes intergenerational trauma. Can you speak about that particular issue? Issue. I mean, we learn so much of how to cope with reality in the world from our childhood experiences. So abused children learn coping mechanisms. And then it's really hard to unlearn. It, people can change, but it takes a lot of work and effort to change. And it's easy to fall back on old habits that worked in the So once you've learned to cope with mistreatment by being blind to it, and, and once you've learned even how to be how to mistreat other people because you were treated, it's it makes sense that you're more prone to do that when you get stressed um, or challenged as an adult. And I don't want to in any way imply it's like inevitable. I have seen so many people move from childhood betrayal into a, a much more positive situation in life later in their adult life. But it always, always requires some work. It doesn't happen usually effortlessly. When you say work, you mean by therapy, some introspection, and, and, and actually going into why these things happen and understanding the dynamics of it. Yeah, it could be formal therapy or it could be people, um, people may figure out things about themselves in their past through writing or close relationships, friendships. It's, there's not just one path, but it does require reprocessing and, and changing the way one understands now let's talk about the acronym or DARVO. Um, tell us what that is. So yeah, DARVO is an acronym, as you said, and it, the D stands for deny, the A for attack, and the RVO is reverse victim benefit. And this is a strategy that perpetrators can and do use in which they um, are able to deflect blame and accountability on themselves. So if a perpetrator or say commits a sex offense against themselves, they can do when they're when somebody tries the victim tries to hold them accountable, they can deny that and say, No, I didn't do that. Sometimes with really over the top denials. 
they can attack the credibility of the person making the accusation. So they can say, you're lying, um, you're just trying to get money from me, your memory is not good, you're mentally ill, whatever, they can do that. Um, and, and they then, do. And they do, yeah, no, they can say, you're confused, and somebody else, they'll, they'll do that. Um, and then the, the, the really, I think, insidious part is they put themselves into the victim role and turn the, vic the true victim into the offender role. So they say, you're making this false accusation against me. I'm the victim here. They switch roles. Yeah, they switch roles. And it's very effective. People don't even necessarily notice it. or I mean, they notice something's going on, but they can't articulate what it is. It's very disorienting. Mm -hmm. I've seen it in the courtroom, so I know exactly when the evidence shows that someone was abused and the perpetrator says, oh, no, I was the victim. Yeah. It, it, it's quite common and it can and it can, I sadly say, be effective. Mm -hmm. um, I think we saw it in some famous trials, too. Um, we saw it with the Bill Cosby. He tried to play the victim. You know, the old man victim and all these women are lying, they're gold diggers. And fortunately, a jury saw through that. Yeah. Um, but it, it happens all the time and sometimes effectively, I'm, I'm sorry to say. Yeah. Now, um, now there's been some talk um, about people that say, oh, this, these people, their, their memories are faulty or they're not remembering what really happened. What do you say to that? Um, is, is, is there any truth in that? Well, memory is imperfect. And um, not everything people say they remember actually did occur. That's just part of, you know, being alive. We all know that. Um, you know, I think uh, it's also a very convenient way to attack somebody's credibility. And um, each case has to be considered on its own individual merits. Um, but often there's... Um, a misunderstanding in, in how likely it is somebody would make up, say, being the victim of something like sexual abuse. The, the research suggests that it can happen, but it's pretty rare. Mm -hmm. And when people say that something like that happened to them, just on average, they're, they're more likely to be telling you the truth, which mm -hmm. doesn't solve the problem of deciding an individual case, but maybe should make people be a little a little cautious in jumping to the conclusion that um, there was a memory. Now, when a victim is abused, um, there's many, there's myriad um, manifestations, dissociation, uh, physical um, illness. Um, what have you seen most um, as manifestations of this betrayal trauma in, in your laboratory? Uh, well, when we first started to work on it, we were really interested in memory and other kinds of dissociation. Um, but with time, we, we started to look at other symptoms that are commonly seen with trauma. And we were surprised to see betrayal was strongly associated with a lot of other symptoms, especially anxiety. Um, betrayal is like if you look at people who are sexually abused by a stranger versus sexually abused by somebody they trust, um, they're much more likely to have an anxiety problem if it's somebody they trust. That might not that I you know might not be totally obvious to people before they look at this research. And I've come to understand that betrayal creates a kind of existential anxiety. If they don't have your back, that's a uh, that's a very threatening situation. Now, we've seen it in law enforcement. We've seen it in the courts. We've seen it in the church. Um, uh, where, where else um, have you seen some of these types of behaviors? Medical, medical So people who are patients, and we all are at some time patients in hospitals or medical clinics or with doctors, can get very betrayed at the institu by the institution. So one one way that can happen, I mean, it can involve sexual experience, but it's not restricted to that. But another way it can happen is 
let's say you go into the hospital and have a surgery, and there's an error, which happens quite often. There's medical error. Um, once there's been medical error, there. This is now when the situation can be very great. If the patient reports error, the hospital can respond by acknowledging it and saying, yes, so sorry, we made this mistake, we're going to do these things to make it right. Or they can respond by denying it and um, refusing to help the victim, blaming them, and so on, which then can become a whole new new injury. And it's like institutional betrayal on top of it. And it's associated with really bad physical outcomes, never mind that it makes people feel bad. Actually, it's in it interferes with their physical recovery from the surgery. Mm -hmm. And I would assume, too, people that um, are accused of uh, a crime that didn't do the crime and are, you know, put on death row, and we know that has happened many, many times, that's the ultimate betrayal of the system. Yeah, I mean, it is an extreme betrayal. I would say when a government orders genocide on its own citizens, that's awful. Yeah. That's the yeah. ultimate betrayal, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and we've seen that throughout history. Right. What about, like... Um, have you spoken with Christine Blasey Ford and Anita Hill and, and those women? Did they feel betrayed by the system? Uh, I think that um, it is my strong impression that they both were betrayed by the system. Um, I haven't, I've spoken with both of them. I haven't asked them that question outright that you're describing. Um, I've spoken more with Christine Blasey Ford um, and what was clear to me from watching the videos in both their cases of the, the hearing is that they were very much the subjects of, they were, what they said was denied, their credibility was attacked. And in both cases, the, they were put into that offender role. There was that total switching of roles that mm -hmm. occurred, um, which was very, it's very hurtful and very, um, very painful to experience. Uh, I certainly think that they, they both were very betrayed by uh, institutions that are at our highest levels. Mm -hmm. And it's something, you know, I really hope we, we stop doing to other people in the future. I sure do. I, it's very disconcerting to see our legal system like that, because the legal system is supposed to be the ultimate arbiter of you know justice, and more times than not, I've seen just the opposite. And I watched um, those um, those hearings, I should say, and their testimony was impeccable, and it was impeachable. It was unimpeachable, uh, yet. Uh, their, their credibility was attacked and they again were putting put in the uh, offender role which I found uh, very uh, disingenuous and I'm, I'm wondering too if they weren't women if they would have been treated j differently what do you think about that well our research does indicate women are more likely to be garbo than men um, to be the recipients of that garbo response um, and of course, we live in a world where there is a lot of sexism and discrimination and the doubting of women's experience. So it would be pretty surprising to me that it wasn't a, a profound gender effect going on. Um, at the same time, men can be the victims of Garbo and um, the other dimensions of inequality are probably very relevant as well. So Now, what about... Um have you studied any intergenerational um, effect of this type of trauma? And, and if you have, what have you found? Yes, we have looked at the intergenerational transmission of betrayal trauma, and we found that people who've been, who are victims of betrayal trauma in their own childhood are more likely on average to have children who, are, who fall victim. But um, again, it's not inevitable. So in, in the cases of, of, say, mothers who were victimized as children, if they are able to get support, maybe through therapy or good friends and come to terms with some of their own mistreatment, 
they're less likely to end up with children who experience similar mistreatment. And one way to understand that is by the breaking down the trail blind. So that instead of using the trail blindness when their child's being hurt, they, they remain away. Now, I've also read that the endocrine system also can be bombarded um, with some of the, the these traumas um, and that potentially maybe that might be epigenetic. Do you have any findings on that? No, I don't. But I think that's a really interesting domain, having you for more research. I mean, one of the reasons that I recently created a nonprofit is the Center for Institutional Courage is in order to support exactly that kind of research. I think there's a whole lot. We do know some things about the trail, trauma and institutional betrayal and so on, but there's so much more we don't know and we need a lot more research. Do you have any other items you'd like to share with people so they know more about your work and, and things to look out for and what they might, um, how they can get, if they are in such a situation, how they can get out? Yeah. Well, you know, getting out is, depends on having the support usually. And so, um, so I think, you know, it's one of the things we wrote about in Blind to Betray is how to find and assess that support so that it's possible to escape from these abusive brain relationships. Um, but it can be done. One of the things I'm really excited about is newest research on institutional courage, which is like the antidote to institutional betrayal. And we have found that when institutions act with courage, that it has many, many positive effects on the individuals who depend on the institution and even the institution itself. So examples of institutional courage are things like apologizing, acknowledging wrongdoings, apologizing for them, cherishing the whistleblower. There are certain things that courageous institutions can do that have all these benefits. And again, we need to do keep doing research on this, but it's very promising what we've seen. So I, I think there's this real chance for a better world in the future if we, if we follow some some of the, the guidelines that my colleagues and I have set up. Yeah, and, and, um, and in South Africa, from, from your book, I gathered that there's been some uh, courage there and institutional courage there with what happened in acknowledging the apartheid. Yes, yes, I mean, the, the good thing is we can find examples of institutional courage all over. It's just that they're too far, far between. So. But they're there, and every time there's institutional courage, it's almost always a good outcome. Yeah, we just need more of them. We do, we need more, yeah. Well, well, this has been a fascinating discussion. Yes, for me too, thank you. I want to thank our guest, Dr. Jennifer Fried, for sharing her research and opinions on betrayal, blindness, trauma, and abuse. I also want to thank you, our viewers, for tuning in. For more information on today's topic and our guest, visit us online at thelegaledition.com. And remember, this information is for general educational purposes. It is not legal or professional advice. And now you can download our podcasts and subscribe online. Find us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter.